Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Mindy Wright, a member of CMC's Board of Trustees and the facilitator of the nonprofit Higher Education Plus Alliance. CMC welcomes everyone, and you can see a list of all members and guests who are here on your flyer. Today's forum, Criminal Sentence Reform, will explore the ongoing and bipartisan effect effort to address what has been an inequitable and expensive history of incarceration. Today's forum, featuring perspectives of lawmakers, is the first of two. Part two, in two weeks' time on Wednesday, June 5th, and referenced in your forum flyer, will feature community leaders with specific expertise on the topic. For the moment, let's just say that change is in the air and it's been a long time coming. So let's hear from our panel. Please welcome Franklin County Prosecutor Ron O'Brien, State Senator 9th District Cecil Thomas, Columbus City Attorney Zach Klein, State Senator District 22, and Ohio Senate President Larry Obhoff, and our and our host, State House News Bureau Chief for Ohio Public Radio and TV, Kev Karen Kassler. Karen, the podium is yours. In full disclosure, we started this conversation at the City Club of Cleveland in April. And so you folks are now in competition with the City Club to see who has the best audience questions. I, I have no doubt what's going to happen. So I, I know uh, Andy Campbell has told us to tell a lot of stories and, and not drag people down with numbers. I'm going to ignore that and drag you down with a couple of numbers. Ohio spends $1.8 billion on corrections every year and employs 12,259 people, 23% of all all state employees work for DRC. As of the May 2019 DRC monthly fact sheet, there are 49,147 people in Ohio's prisons, and the average cost per inmate is $27,835 a year. So with that in mind, let's talk about criminal sentencing reform. And I want to start with you, Zach Klein. Uh, you and Ron O'Brien here on the panel, right next to each other, were rivals at one point uh, when uh, you both ran for city prosecutor, or county prosecutor, rather. Last year you teamed up, though, you were concerned about issue one, which many people might remember here was overwhelmingly defeated. It was a criminal justice reform issue. You said that you have kept the good from issue one, got rid of the bad from issue one, and now you've come up with something that you feel really does a better job. What makes what we're talking about here with Senate Bill 3 better, and, and why should voters who overwhelmingly disapproved of Issue 1 support this? Thanks, Karen, and thanks to uh, the Columbus Metropolitan Club for having me. I think the last time I was on this stage was when Ron kicked my butt in the debate we had for the Franklin <laughs> County Prosecutor. So uh, it's great to be sitting next to him now in a more friendly atmosphere. Uh, but uh, you look, the reality is every day can't be election day, and that we do have to work together to build bipartisan coalitions to tackle things that are important to people in the state of Ohio or in our own backyard, and that's why it was so important for Ron and I and our respective uh, positions as city attorney and county prosecutor because our offices work so closely together and are so aligned um, to inform and come up with major public policy changes that are going to be for the betterment of the state of Ohio and the city of Columbus and Franklin County. And that's where we are uh, with Senate Bill 3. Uh, the, as you mentioned, Karen, Senate, or Issue 1 uh, was resoundingly defeated uh, at the ballot box this past November. Uh, and there was a lot of criticism surrounding what Issue 1 was at the time. Uh, but there was some good things in Issue 1, uh, in our opinion. Uh, and that's where we found the commonality uh, where really Ron and I in a regular meeting about uh, what life was going to be like if Issue 1 passed, because if it did, I would be inheriting possibly thousands of misdemeanor, newly reclassified misdemeanor drug cases. And so instead of waiting in the unknown of an election, we wanted to get to ahead of the ball and ahead of the curve uh, and start meeting about what that transition would look like from a staffing standpoint, from a workload standpoint. And it was in that meeting uh, that I remember Ron literally turned over a piece of paper and we started talking about all the things that we did agree upon. Uh, and it was really the, the criticism of, of what was reflected in issue one that were the highlights and what we took out to build the Klein O'Brien plan that within is now manifested in a lot of ways through Senate Bill 3. So I want to say that 
Senate Bill 3 is not Issue 1. Uh, you look at the criticism of, of Issue 1, one of, the, one of it was it should not be in the Constitution, it should be done legislatively. Well, we have Senators uh, Thomas and, uh, and President Obhoff here because we're going the legislative route. Uh, one of the criticisms was uh, the proliferation of fentanyl and the dangers in our community and how you could downgrade that to a misdemeanor could be a danger uh, in our state. That is an exception. We do uh, allow and are requesting a downgrade from low amounts of felony possession to a misdemeanor, but we accept out date rape drugs uh, and fentanyl. You know, another criticism was about um, some good time credit uh, that may apply to human traffickers uh, and uh, to arsonists uh, for serving prison sentences. And that received a lot of criticism during the campaign. That was not in our proposal. So uh, while folks who are the detractors of issue one want to say, well, you are just are bringing that back up again. It was resoundingly defeated. Let's just move on with our lives. But we have to remember what we're doing is not issue one. What we're doing is Senate Bill 3, uh, and it does allow for a downgrade um, to misdemeanors with in favor of uh, rehab rehabilitation over incarceration and reforming the way we also do probation violations to give people the hope and the opportunity that they have in the intersection of addiction and mental health in the criminal justice system, which has been way too punitive uh, and lacking any common sense for a long time. And I think it's a better reflective of the way that we're treating and should be treating criminal justice in our society. I want to ask Ron O'Brien the next question. Drug courts, that was one of the big things that people looked at when it came to issue one and the concern that that would really make drug courts less relevant, that the judges and, and people in the drug court system wouldn't have that threat to hang over people to get them into treatment. What does this bill do here? Because you've got some local officials who are criticizing Senate Bill 3 as saying, if you take away the possibility of possession as a felony, you take away that negative consequence, that threat of prison. What do you think? Uh, thank you, Karen, and I too would uh, congratulate the uh, Metropolitan Club for addressing this issue. Uh, uh, I think what it does is it uh, preserves the ability to deal with these kind of cases in a drug court setting. Uh, let's not forget that just because the offense is being treated as a misdemeanor, that it's uh, ali ali in free. You can go to jail for 180 days as a misdemeanor offense. Many serious misdemeanors drunk driving, uh, domestic violence, hit skip, other serious uh, misdemeanors uh, are penalized and are penalized in uh, a municipal court. There may be an issue of funding because that's done at the local level uh, that uh, I think would be concurrently addressed in the budget that's being considered at the same time Senate Bill uh, 3 is, but I think from uh, our viewpoint, we have a very successful drug court here in Franklin County. I went to Judge Vandercar in 2009, then he was in the mental health court judge and asked him if he could expand it because not surprisingly, people with mental health issues also have substance abuse issues and we were seeing uh, that occur with uh, the people who possessed small amounts of uh, drugs. Uh, we got the police department to sign on as uh, the law enforcement agency in favor of treating rather than jailing people. Uh, as we saw the opiate pill problem and then later the heroin problem expand, we uh, started a separate docket now handled by Judge Jody Thomas, who uh, you'll hear from next week, but is doing just a great job in between the passion that Judge Vandercar gave and that Judge uh, Thomas uh, continues to give. And uh, Judge Tyak uh, for a period of time still handles a drug docket. And uh, since they overlapped some, uh, Judge Moorhart on the mental health docket, all of those things can be handled in municipal court. And the criticism that uh, I have heard that uh, I think Senate Bill can address is that you can continue successful drug courts that are in common police courts. Common police courts have jurisdiction over misdemeanor offenses, rarely exercised generally, especially in your larger counties. But there's concurrent jurisdiction. So a successful drug court in a county in Ohio, and what uh, I have emphasized in talking to uh, uh, both uh, Senator Eklund, President Obhoff, and uh, uh, Senator Thomas is, let the local people have sufficient flexibility that a successful drug court can continue to work if they want to keep it in common police court as uh, uh, Judge uh, Peppel in Oglace County wants to do, have it sufficient that he can do that. If we want to keep it uh, as we believe it's successful in municipal court, uh, let there be enough flexibility to do that as well. 
I, uh, Senator Thomas, I want to address my next question to you. You're also a former police officer, yeah. so you have a lot of experience in both the legislative area but also the law enforcement area. It seems like this bill and, and efforts to try to deal with criminal justice reform are trying to separate the low-level offender struggling with addiction who deserves a second chance from he may need a push toward it, though, yeah. from the unrepentant drug trafficker who deserves to go to prison. How can you do that with legislation? Well, uh, this, this, this legislation, in, uh, speaking on, on, uh, as a former law enforcement officer, this is really going to benefit them significantly because of the, the amount of time and, and effort that is spent uh, arresting someone for some low-level nonviolent offense, uh, having to spend time in, in a court setting on a regular basis, uh, uh, tr pro uh, moving through the process, and it, and it's just, it, it, we're putting an individual in, in, in the penitentiary simply because we have no other ch uh, choice as law enforcement officers. Uh, it would be huge to the officers to know that all I have to do is get this individual into uh, uh, a drug court and then uh, allow the system to work with that individual to to uh, address that issue. That thereby not having to uh, deal with this individual in the future, uh, you're building a, uh, an individual to be able to take care of his family, to be, to remain uh, in the community. So that's that's a critical uh, uh, area of importance as this legislation is, is moving forward. And I, I want to comment on uh, the the uh, first question. Um, I'm a firm believer in things happen for a reason. Uh, issue one brought us to where we are now. So we needed to have this dialogue, and, and I'm just so thankful that we had this spirited debate. Uh, 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 there obviously was some need in our state, and it brought us to where we are today. And this is, this is just the beginning, uh, folks. I think there's a lot that uh, uh, Senator Abhoff and, and the other members here of the panel, along with our legislative body, that we can do to enhance further uh, the issues that we're, we're discussing. When you talk about spirit of debate, issue one was a big part of last year's gubernatorial race. And so, President Obhoff, I want to ask you, you talk to Governor DeWine quite often. He was opposed to issue one, like you. Uh, what, what has he told you about what is in this bill? And, and what have you talked to Speaker Larry Householder about to, to try to make sure that what you have here would actually move forward? I think that what we're all focused on is trying to make sure that we have the right public policy for the state of Ohio. And, uh, and uh, in my discussions with the governor, he's uh, largely letting the uh, legislative process run its course. Uh, uh, but as a former prosecutor, he obviously uh, wants to make sure that we're doing what we can to protect our, our communities and our families. And uh, uh, frankly, um, in, in my view, uh, if you're following the right public policy, you are protecting your communities. Um, it's not just about being tough on crime or weak on crime. What we've tried to do over the last eight or nine years in, in the Ohio legislature is be smart on crime, get uh, um, policies that are more likely to work and give people a second chance uh, at life and, and draw the distinctions that, that you mentioned in one of the earlier questions between people who've maybe made a mistake or two or 10 um, and separate them out from people who are predators, who are preying on our families and on our communities. And um, we're not quite there yet, but if you look back uh, all the way to 2000, 2011 with, uh, with House Bill 86, um, Senate Bill 66 in the last General Assembly, the uh, TCAP program to the extent that some of it remained in the last budget. Um, we've been gradually building up to that and uh, as we have taken a smart on crime approach, as we have made a presumption against jail time for nonviolent fourth and fifth degree felons and we've banned the box for state employment um, and we've uh, created more opportunities for treatment and for intervention in lieu of conviction, we've seen our recidivism rate go significantly lower than the national average. So um, I, I don't have any recent statistics with me, but, uh, but there are some stories from uh, 2015 where Gary Moore talked about our recidivism rate. The national average at the time was 49.7 percent and after we had instituted some of these policies, Ohio rate was 27.5 percent. So it does give some people a, a second chance at life and the opportunity uh, to turn things around. Uh, but that's also better for the rest of us. That means that our communities are safer. Lower recidivism rates mean that we all uh, are less likely to be victims of crime. So I think that this is uh, 
the right policy for offenders, but also the right policy for the rest of us. And um, I think that if you asked uh, Governor DeWine or, or Speaker Householder what they're worried about, they'd say the same things. I want to throw this question out to all of you. Uh, the anti-side is essentially not represented here, though we do have two prosecutors. Prosecutors are concerned about this. They say the numbers show the bill doesn't actually get tougher on drug traffickers. And this is an example. Uh, right now, a person possessing between 100 and 500 doses of heroin and 60 to 600 hits of meth would have mandatory prison time. That's the law right now. Under Senate Bill 3, they say a person could possess up to 600 hits of meth or up to 300 doses of heroin and be charged with a third degree felony and possible probation. They say that they're concerned about about that, that, that that's not dealing with the low level. Any, nobody would call that low level drug possession. So let me ask you folks, anybody who wants to weigh in on that? Well, I, I'll be the first to weigh in on it. This whole philosophy of believing that uh, 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 being um, more severe of a penalty is going to deter it's just not happening. We've seen it uh, over and over again. You can raise the penalty to, to something even much more severe, but you're going to still have the same individuals uh, who are career traffickers or whatever the case may be. They're going to do it. And then on the flip side of that, you have individuals that we, we, we hear questions as to if you know that this, this, this uh, heroin is going to get you uh, sent to the prison and all of this. Uh, a lot of these individuals who are addicted, the first thing they say is, is I don't think that way. All I think about is, is dealing with my addiction. So it, it just does not work believing that uh, putting more fear as to uh, the penalty as a reason to address the problem. But aren't those big numbers? Aren't those big numbers of drugs to be carrying around for personal possession? I, I think I would uh, say to that, uh, Karen, there are other statutes. We're talking about reducing the, the possession charge uh, to um, a misdemeanor level. There are other statutes. If you have a basis to believe the person is a dealer and is trafficking in the drugs, we can use another statute, uh, another tool in that toolbox other than mere possession to charge them. Uh, if uh, they're in little packages, uh, uh, 50 separate packages separately wrapped in a little glassine bag, uh, there's a statute that uh, is, is a felony and will continue to be a felony that no person shall prepare for distribution uh, uh, a controlled substance. And in that case, if I had a, a basis of believing the person was a trafficker, then I would charge them with the felony that still exists of preparing for uh, distribution, the drugs that they uh, have, rather than the mere possession that would be criti criticized for reducing it to a misdemeanor level. And I think there's another statute that de it deals with transportation. If you transport uh, a drug uh, for uh, distribution, you can be charged with a felony. That would still remain on the books and untouched by Senate Bill th uh, 3. So I think there's some things you can do as a prosecutor if you uh, believe and the police uh, give you information to believe that the person's a trafficker, not a possessor of drugs. Uh, most people uh, um, I have seen um, who would fit in the kind of misdemeanor treatment that this bill would give them are addicts. And Karen, if I may, I think what Senate Bill 3 does is it shifts the conversation to the underlying question of why does an individual commit a crime? Uh, is it because of drug addiction? Is it because of mental health? Is it because of lack of economic, economic opportunity? Other social determinants? Is the person a bad person? Is it all of the above, none of the above? And what Senate Bill 3 does, specifically as it relates to possession, is it puts the focus on uh, addiction. And we, as a society, for far too long have, in my opinion, um, over felonized uh, too many con too much conduct because the felony conviction basically brings a life sentence in a lot of ways because of the social barriers that we've created with felony convictions you can talk to many of the fortune 500 ceos that are desperate to hire folks but simply will not hire felons as much as they want to for various reasons I and mean, that's a whole other debate but for various reasons the reality is they won't hire them um, to the legal stigmas associated with uh, barriers to housing and employment. So we're asking someone uh, to pull themselves off up from their bootstraps uh, when we've taken off their boots. And that's essentially what a felony conviction is. it does. Now that doesn't mean there are still bad people that deserve to go to jail for a very long time. There are murderers, there are rapists, there's robbers, there's human traffickers, and they deserve to be labeled as felons. But 
There are also folks who are afflicted with addiction, who have mental health problems. And Senate Bill 3 is a significant step forward that allows prosecutors in a common sense, I think, appropriate way to appreciate that these people are not the dangerous ones that we are worried about in society, but the ones that are sick and need help. So why would we want to have that person be described as a felon in society when they really are battling an addiction issue? We need to be focusing on their treatment because if you really want to focus on community safety, which I think we can all agree that's a, one of the roles the prosecutor has, it should be about recidivism rates. And the only way that you're going to drive down recidivism rates is if you tackle the underlying reason why someone commits a crime. Otherwise, it's the old adage of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And that's been the criminal justice system for decades in our country. Let's focus on conviction rates for the human traffickers and the murderers and the rapists and the robbers. And let's focus on recidivism rates for those who desperately need help. And Senate Bill 3 is a step in that direction. Well, and, and Karen, I would add, uh, I guess that um, if what we're talking about is do we have the right numbers um, or what's in the bill, the correct amounts for distinguishing between traffickers or, or people who are possessing for personal use, then the discussion is not uh, or shouldn't be, hey, let's throw out the bill. The discussion should be, here's what the right numbers ought to be. Can we sit down and talk through these and, and try to arrive at something that, that prosecutors are more comfortable with or that judges might be more comfortable with? And we've been having those discussions the entire spring. Uh, in fact, I spent about half of my morning um, meeting with uh, members of the judiciary and, and law enforcement uh, and the sponsors of the bill talking about you know, some of these issues. Uh, and, uh, and I've spent a significant amount of time, and I know other members have too, including the sponsors of the bill, um, sitting down with the local prosecutors and, and local judges who have concerns and, and walking through those. Uh, because the, the fact of the matter is, uh, sentencing reform is, is going to pass, um, and that's just how it's going to be. And and so the question is, um, let's get together, figure out what works and what doesn't, and make sure that we end up in a place that we all agree is the right public policy for the state of Ohio. You have said before, actually, that too many penalties don't match up with the nature of the offense. And so it's almost like that's where we are in the space with these numbers, is where do you match it up, right? And, and I think the answer to that question is um, sit down and, and explain to us what you think the real numbers ought to be. And, uh, and we'll have a back and forth and eventually figure out what, uh, what the numbers should be. Um, not let's uh, throw out the bill wholesale because the first introduced version of it didn't have enough to make every person happy. It's called compromise. <laughs> <laughs> I might add too, Karen, that uh, this bill uh, had input from the Sentencing Commission, from what myself and Mr. Klein uh, did, from uh, the Judicial Conference. It, it, it was introduced as a skeleton bill without great details, and then Senator Eklund uh, uh, and Sean O'Brien filled in the blanks. I might add too that uh, it wasn't writing on a clean slate either because uh, Senator Thomas and uh, President Obhoff, as well as uh, Senator Eklund, all served on the recodification committee that uh, I also served on. And uh, that uh, picked up a lot of what was recommended by that group of about, what, 25 people that yeah. studied uh, the, the criminal code from beginning to end, but we spent a lot of uh, time on the drug chapter. Absolutely. Yeah, that uh, your work concluded almost two years ago. Well, two years ago in June. So, and there are elements of the recodification committee's task force in this. There are substantial, substantial yeah. portions of their findings are in this bill. Now, when we were at the City Club of Cleveland, and by we I mean President Obhoff and Zach Klein, uh, so we've had this conversation a little bit anyway. We, we uh, talked with uh, Ohio Legislative Black Caucus President St Representative Stephanie House. She had endorsed issue one, and she said she wants to help people change and be better when they come back from prison. And uh, the sponsor of the bill, Senator John Eklund, has said that as well. But that's not the case for many people who go to prison. They don't come back better after they leave prison. Is there anything in this bill that helps people come back from prison better? The people who actually do end up going, is there anything in this bill that helps them? Um, well, uh, we have made significant uh, changes and, and frankly significant investments through the budget process in, uh, in other uh, legislation. So uh, I wouldn't say that Senate Bill 3 is the cure-all 
um, for all the problems that we face uh, as a state. But uh, uh, if you look at House Bill 529 uh, from the last General Assembly, that was our capital budget, um, the, the state invested hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, including some from the, uh, the community projects allocation into drug treatment and rehabilitation. Uh, it is some of the news coverage at the time said that uh, we had set aside $222 million for infrastructure to support programs for opioid addiction treatment and related services. Um, in, uh, in House Bill 49, the, uh, the prior biennial budget, uh, we had allocated an additional $180 million in targeted prevention, uh, recovery, and enforcement efforts to combat the opioid epidemic. Uh, so this is an ongoing process. It's not all packed into one bill, uh, but I do think that Senate Bill 3 needs to um, when it is passed, uh, incorporate, or a different bill will need to incorporate uh, into, into its um, fiscal policies, uh, some of the policies that, uh, that Senate Bill 3 would be changing as, as underlying you know, criminal uh, statutes. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense uh, from my perspective to make massive changes um, or, or, or any changes really to uh, criminal law that will have financial effects uh, downstream, whether it's to addiction treatment centers or to our local courts, um, without also then building in somewhere else the um, the funding to pay for that. So, so there are a lot of moving parts uh, and there are a lot of different pieces of legislation that work together to try to combat some of these issues. Uh, but um, again, I, I would say Senate Bill 3 is a big step in the right direction, but it's not the be all end all. Our work will never be finished on this issue. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, that's uh, um, what I would also say is, is that uh, there's no exact science to uh, criminal justice reform. Uh, this is why we have to collectively put our minds together and, and, and work through a lot of uh, the issues. Um, uh, 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 the recodification uh, committee and a lot of things that were brought forth. It's not easy to get all of our legislators to agree at the same time and uh, to get a majority. But, but working through it, allowed, just like talking about compromising on, on this one issue here, working through those issues allow us to continue to go down this road. Uh, there's all, I've, I've spoke about retroactivity. That, that's a tough one. It's, it, it, so we got to work through that, and it's going to take a while. Uh, I believe it was mentioned that we spend 27000 uh, somewhere in that number, 27800 a year for one inmate. And if you multiply that by... Um, the number of inmates that would qualify under this under, under this bill that may be in the penitentiary, I believe it's we bring in 2,600 a year to average, and about 1,300 of those are low-level nonviolent offenders. So if you multiply that number by 27,800, you're going to come up with about 36 million dollars that we could use to put back into treatment and some of these other things. And Lord knows how many other individuals are in there on a very low-level nonviolent offenses. Period. If we get to that point, we could significantly reduce the population in our prisons as well as utilize those dollars for treatment. Well, I, and I think that there's a significant indirect impact on the prison uh, rehabilitative side, and that is you're not going to prison at all because it's going to be downgraded to a misdemeanor. So there's the indirect version that you're not even going to prison and also the indirect version that you're not going to be a felon. Um, so um, I think that is a, a very significant impact on someone's life. Absolutely. If I could add to, uh, although I haven't had a chance to study it just yesterday, House Bill 1, uh, which is a priority bill uh, in the House, was uh, much like John Eklund did, uh, Sheriff Plummer and Rep Representative Hicks uh, Hudson uh, introduced a bill to deal with drug sentencing reform. And one of the things that they include, which addresses the problem someone coming out of prison has uh, regarding housing or employment, is it broadens the uh, provisions of the expungement statute so that someone coming out of prison has uh, the ability to expunge or even if they didn't go to prison, they're on probation, has the ability to expunge those offenses. And again, that broadens their employment opportunities. It broadens their ability to rent a, uh, uh, an apartment. Uh, again, not controllable too much by the government. I've had people call us and say, you know, I can't rent an apartment because uh, the landlord has this policy of I don't rent to felons because they probably aren't a good, you know, uh, risk as far as monthly payment of uh, rent. 
you know, that's something at least I don't think I can control for sure. I don't know that the legislature can control, but if they don't have that felony in the first place or if they can expunge it, then they can engage in that uh, uh, rental contract and that gives them a place uh, to live. And we're going to be going to audience questions in just a minute, so if you have some, please go ahead and step over to the microphone and I'll turn to you in just a moment, but I have one final question that I'll ask you, and you folks have hinted at this. Uh, is there anything in this bill that actually does re retroactively reclassify felonies as misdemeanors? And is, if, if not, is that something that should happen? I mean, you're talking about expungement, but what about retroactively reclassifying felonies as misdemeanors? Well, that's that's something that I think the legislature will have to decide, and uh, and we will have a substantial discussion about it. Um, my personal view is that if we are taking something, and uh, and I don't speak on behalf of, of my caucus or, or the Senate as a whole, um, but my personal view is that if we have said uh, that something was an unduly harsh penalty to begin with, uh, and we are now making the policy decision that it should be lowered, um, then it ought to be lowered for people who did it last month, uh, just like it is for people who do it next month. And, uh, and in the past, I actually have... Uh, um, um, personally proposed uh, amendments to legislation that did this in some other areas. For example, uh, our laws related to uh, carrying firearms in, in vehicles used to be uh, far more complex than they are now. They contained what I would call traps for the unwary, uh, where people who thought that they were following the law found out that they weren't and then were charged with a significant firearm penalty. Um, and then at some point in 2011 or 2012, we went back and looked at those statutes and said, okay, it doesn't need to be this complex. It doesn't need to have a bunch of traps in it. And when we got rid of those, um, we included a provision to um, clear people's records uh, if, if they had been uh, convicted of something that we have now adjudged as a legislature should not have been a crime to begin with. So that's not quite the same scenario here, but I do think that you want uh, um, consistency over time. And if what we're really talking about is um, deciding uh, whether or not something is, is a, a bad act because it's a bad act uh, versus um, something that we'd like you to get a second chance on, um, it, it, as a personal matter, I think that it, it is worth going back and, and taking a look at prior offenses as well. We have a line stacked up. This is great. <laughs> and I agree it, with, go right I agree with President, President Alpov. I think Senate Bill 3 is a significantly good start in the public pro policy process. Um, and I think one of the best revisions um, that I'm going to continue to advocate for is the retroactivity portion. And I, I appreciate and applaud of the Senate President's advocacy in that area. And the reason for that retroactivity is going to open up uh, countless uh, op opportunities for application for jobs. Uh, individuals will be able to apply for jobs that they normally would not have been able to apply for. Now, as, as a practical matter, that makes things far more challenging because uh, it creates a significant burden on law enforcement and on judges, and uh, there are a lot of things that need to be worked through. But. Uh, um, and I, just, I know one, just 30 seconds. All right. but, and, and I'm sorry, but I think it's so important in, the, in this criminal justice space that it's never, and it's really rarely talked about this way, but we have to talk about criminal justice reform as an economic development policy too, because it does create economic opportunity for individuals. And that's, that's what's missing as part of the debate. All right, well, it is CMC's tradition to take audience questions. Please state your name and ask your question. Make it a question, please. Let's get started. Brad. 20-year state prosecutor and federal prosecutor, and I direct this to uh, Senator Hophoff. You're dealing with the front end. You don't want to put more people in prison, and you should select those people out. You need to deal with the back end, and there's a way to do that. The feds just did something called the First Step Act, and it's rare the feds ever get there before you guys do. But here, you could take clemency, and instead of playing games with pardons and saying, oh, let them work it out in paperwork, you should make people say, I did this wrong. I'm in a situation where I can do some things right in prison. I prove myself and I get into a classification that allows you to take time off. So you eliminate the thousands and thousands of people in the back end who are stuck there for 10 years. So my, um, my question is, what do you think? <laughs> 
I guess my answer to the, to the question is uh, I, I'd be happy to sit down and talk with you about it. I actually made some handwritten notes while I was up here, and I, I put the First Step Act in the margin, and that was something that, that Zach and I had, uh, had considered writing about uh, earlier in the year because uh, I do think that the federal government uh, uh, made a major improvement to the way things run. Um, and, uh, and it was, I think, a very good example of bipartisanship, which is all too rare in Washington, probably for the last two decades. Uh, but to see a, a supermajority, uh, I, I believe it was a supermajority, maybe, maybe it wasn't, but I think I know it was a bipartisan majority in both chambers and, and President Trump um, all be on the same page on something like this, um, I, I think tells you the merits uh, of, of the underlying law. And I think it was a, it was a good step for them. Um, and, and so one of the things that, that I've done is uh, I, I've, I've sort of just in, in, in conversation labeled Senate Bill 3 as the next step act uh, or, or it's time for states to take the next step and I think that's what we're doing here. I think it's interesting to note that almost every bill that you've mentioned here has bipartisan support, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. So go ahead. Uh, yes, Mr. Thomas, Mike Tam I'm Tammy White and I'm here to ask a question. A dear friend of mine has been held on civil contempt of court for four and a half years. It's a very high profile cat case here in central Ohio. Uh, it's Tommy Thompson. Probably most of you have heard about the case. Uh, he's been held uh, contempt of court. That's not a crime. He is um, ill. He's in a wheelchair. And I have been intimately involved in the case, being involved in all of the, the um, hearings. He has been denied, been denied medical treatment that he needs. My question to you, is there any considerations in this bill to take in hand? Why would you be holding someone in contempt of court, which is not a crime, for that length of period of time? To me, it seems like it's an abuse of power. Now, that's a federal case, and I don't think there's anything think in this. It's both, civil and, it's both civil and federal. Yes, it is civil. In, in connection with the federal case, though, isn't it? It's, it's being held on, on civil and federal. It's both cases, yes. Yeah, but it's in connection with the federal case? I, I think what you're saying, you can't. Yeah, I, I don't think, and the bill won't address it, and, I, and I'm, I'm not sure it could, at least if it's a case I'm thinking of. Well, it's, there was a civil, the civil trial there was must, conducted. There might be an opportunity yeah. for you to yeah. speak to the prosecutor afterwards. So. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much for your question. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Eric Brown, and I have experience both as a judge for many years and currently as a school board member at Columbus City Schools. However, my question is not going to cover either of those experiences. It's more personal than that. And I do commend all of you for the work that you're doing. Uh, I very much like the approach that Senate Bill 3 and, and others uh, represent. The question I have is really about legitimate medical use of prescription medications, including opioids, including a lot of the drugs that we read about all the time. Uh, as some of you know, um, I've got a daughter who uses medications for chronic pain, serious pain. My own experience, having survived cancer five years ago and, and being cancer free, I used fentanyl for many, year, many months during the time that I was treating. The problem is that many of the drug laws that have been enacted over the last uh, decade or more have made it extremely difficult for physicians and for patients of legitimate medical use to be able to obtain the medications that they and their doctors agree upon are, are appropriate whether that's you know, opioids or uh, any other substance. Sometimes it means that you have to go back and fill your prescription in person every week. That, uh, so, so the point is, can you respond to that? Is there anything that you're working on, I'm sorry, to, uh, uh, whether it's in Senate Bill 3 or otherwise, to address those concerns and not make it so difficult? I hate to interrupt the former yeah. Chief Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court, but go ahead. Well, I, I think I would say, Eric, I don't think that's addressed in this bill, but I have had uh, the same concern um, from some cases presented to me, and I've talked to the chairman of the pharmacy board who assures me that they are trying to do something 
to address that because I think it's a reaction by doctors. They don't want uh, either the medical board or the pharmacy board knocking on their door asking them about the number, amount, frequency of uh, prescriptions they're writing. And at least I think in the enforcement arena by the regulatory agencies might be the solution to that problem, but at least it's not in uh, Senate Bill 3. But I, I agree that it is a problem and it might be in you know, a, a pushback by doctors saying, I don't want people knocking on my door. Well, there have been some state policies, some state changes on uh, those particular drugs, right? So, Correct. yeah. Yeah, this, this whole opioid crisis has, has gotten the attention of everybody. And it's got us all trying to figure out how to best address this entire problem. Uh, and, and that's why we're having this conversation. Uh, and there are going to be many more to address all of these issues that are arising that we never thought we would see. And so uh, I just say uh, we just continue to plug away and we, we'll get all of these uh, issues worked out. But right now it's kind of we just got to try to stop the deaths. And, and that's what we're trying to do. And with most policy changes, there's oftentimes an overcorrection. And I think that when you make policy generally and being a former council member and council president, that sometimes the pendulum swings too far in one direction and you end up getting caught into some situations that you don't want to criminalize. Um, you know, it's Senator Thomas brings up a great point that uh, addiction is not new. It's plagued community of color, uh, communities of color in rural America for decades. It's largely gone unignored. And now that with the proliferation of opioids, uh, we're now talking about the, a new view of the criminal justice system. Uh, and people may have their common of why th that may be the case. Um, but the reality is we have to take advantage of this opportunity uh, to form these new alliances in the criminal justice space and to think about it in a common sense way. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Richard Burke. I founded an organization called A New Path, and it helps mentor men coming out of the judicial system. And I try to get in there a few months before they come into the community to help them you know, get their bearings and see what we're, where we're at. I got started with it through Kairos, but I also thought that there's a lot more I can do for somebody than just pray for them. And I really want to applaud you gentlemen for the work you're doing on behalf of the legislature. Uh, it's gratifying to know that it's reached such a high level and that things are getting done. And Zach, I voted for you, so well done. Thank you. Now, I did have a question. There was a policy that was in place a few years ago, I think Governor Kasich signed it, where it allowed judicial review for 80% of sentences. How well has that gone over? Have people been getting out a little earlier based on that? I think some, some do and some don't. Uh, it, uh, I think, starts with the recommendation from DRC to the, to the judge. The judge has to sign off on it. And uh, uh, I think when it's uh, merited, the court is inclined to favorably grant it. Uh, sometimes we will weigh in on it. Uh, and. Uh, in my view, at least the number of offenses that were eligible for it was broader than what it should have been. But um, uh, I, I think it's working, uh, and I suppose it's according to which side of the fence you may be on, how well you think it's working. And one very brief oh. follow-up. Um, community organizations like my own and many others, we don't want to be like a bunch of stray cats. So how can we best coordinate our efforts to assist in the sentencing reform and getting out, of the com getting out into the community? Well, I, I think that uh, if, if you're interested in um, um, testifying about your experiences or, or why you support the bill, uh, you should reach out to the, uh, the chairman uh, or my office or, or Senator Thomas's office, and, and we're happy to have you come in and, and talk about those things. Um, and, and then going back to your, your first question, that was uh, House Bill 86, uh, which, which became effective in September 2011. Uh, among the other things that, that we did in that bill, we established a risk reduction sentencing so that offenders can get supervised release uh, by completing uh, treatment after they've served 80 percent of their prison term. Uh, so. Um, my personal view is that, uh, as we talked about earlier with regard to recidivism rates, et cetera, I think that the statutes that we have passed have been positive and have accomplished many of the things that they were targeted at doing. Um, and our prison population uh, is uh, lower than it was in 2011 and has, uh, I, I think, um, not 
um, decreased by the number that I would personally have liked to have seen. And I think that many of the legislators who've worked on this issue would like to see um, a lower prison population than we have now. So um, it's been positive developments. They've moved in the right direction, uh, but maybe not far enough. The chair of the Judiciary Committee, by the way, is uh, Senator John Eklund, and you can find all sorts of information, including testimony, on the Ohio Senate's website. So. And, and understand, folks, I, I worked undercover narcotics for years in, 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 in law enforcement, and I sent a whole lot of people to the penitentiary who just had uh, a crack pipe. So once that crack pipe was sent to the lab, it had cra uh, crack residue in it. Just possession of the residue was a felony. And those individuals, uh, and that is not stopped. And, and, and hopefully this kind of reform will end that process. And uh, those individuals, uh, we would no longer be sending individuals to jail for that. Uh, this is kind of where we're going. And I think that uh, example illustrates the problem they have at the legislature in trying to find a one-size-fits-all. We haven't charged trace cases uh, that Senator Thomas uh, referred to for over 10 years. People don't get charged. They don't go to jail or prison for a trace case. But in some counties, even today, uh, uh, charges are filed. So they have a difficulty in trying to deal with uh, uh, the problems in Franklin County, Cuyahoga County, perhaps Akron, uh, Dayton, uh, Toledo, and then there's another set of maybe 15 counties have a different problem, and then another set of 15 to 30 counties that have a third kind of problem. We have time for two more questions. Go ahead with your question. Hi there. My name is Blythe Barno. I'm a minister. I work with Faith and Public Life. Uh, I have a question about the fentanyl exception. Because Ohio's uh, drug supply is so contaminated with fentanyl and there's a lot of cross-contamination and lacing of other drugs, I'm wondering how this bill addresses that. Because if fentanyl is always accepted, most cases that come before uh, you all would actually not be benefited by this legislation. So I'm wondering if you could say more about that. And also fentanyl can come mixed in with other drugs like heroin and meth and cocaine. So that's a great question. Go ahead. Um, sh sure. And, and uh, my, my understanding is that the bill currently um, would include things that are mixed um, as fentanyl and it would be accepted. And, uh, and that was part of our uh, topic of discussion this morning as well. Um, and I think we need to do a better job uh, as a legislature in, uh, in funding uh, some uh, additional technologies for law enforcement so that they can try to determine uh, the various uh, percentages of mixes and those types of things. And we've had some recent state Supreme Court court case law um, related to that, specifically uh, um, how much cocaine actually counts for the purposes of your arrest and, and your sentencing. So um, th there are additional things that need to be sorted out there. But I, I wouldn't say that it's most, um, I, I would say it's a significant amount of the heroin uh, that, that has fentanyl. And obviously, it's, it's, it's oftentimes mixed with other substances. But uh, um, I, don't think we, I don't think we know how many uh, arrests specifically related to any drugs would, would have uh, fentanyl involved in it. Yeah, I think the amount is increasing the number of cases like that, uh, but um, the difficulty is is if you have several grains of fentanyl can be deadly if mixed with even marijuana, which we have been seeing around here uh, r recently, and how you decide what kind of crime that should be. and. Uh, if it's mixed with heroin or mixed with uh, marijuana, it can be deadly. And so uh, I think that, as uh, was mentioned earlier, the legislature will hear from all sides on that and kind of weigh out what's the best way to address that. One and hopefully, cure, cure, I might add, uh, <laughs> Senator Alpoff, that uh, aberrational Supreme Court decision. <laughs> One final quick question. Gentlemen, hi. My, my name is uh, John Handler. I, I'm in the private bail bonds industry here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Senator Thomas, I've spoken at some task force meetings with you, uh, Attorney Klein. I know we've had some interactions in the past. Um, my, my, is the question being asked, uh, Attorney Klein, I'll direct this at you. We talk about drug court. It's being ran fantastic by Judge Jody Thomas. I know her really well. She's doing great. But is the question being asked on who's, who's failing to appear? on these drug cases, for example, on an F4 and F5 first-time arrest, crack, cocaine, marijuana, whatever, they're being released up in the 12th floor on, a, on their own personal recognizance bond. Who's asking the question, though, because I see this on an everyday basis. Do you know the numbers of the amount of people that are failing to appear for court 
I don't know them off the top of my head, but I can say that failure to appear is a big deal. A huge uh, and deal. it's not just in F4, F5 drug possession cases. It's, it's a matter of fact, I think it's more of a travesty when it's uh, a low-level misdemeanor case and that you probably would have gotten time served or had, you know, had some sort of suspended sentence. Then you end up getting arrested for failure to appear because you didn't show up for your kind of minor misdemeanor case. Uh, and it's something that we've had conversations with the public defender's office, the clerk's office, about how can we use technology in our favor with texting and with phone calls to remind people to appear. Uh, because I find it, I mean, personally, just very frustrating uh, when you look at some of our jail numbers of folks that are, that are being arrested for failure to appear when their underlying crime is, it could be considered a nuisance misdemeanor crime. Well, my concern is, is that when you take accountability out of the picture, and you're allowing them to get out with no accountability at all, just a signature to appear, and they do fail to appear. When you talk about technology, that, that would be a cost to the taxpayer. Right now, with, and this isn't an issue about well, bail we, reform. We need to wrap it up, I'm so I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I, I just wanted to go over the, the, the actual, who's asking the questions on who's failing to appear and how exactly are you fixing it? Yeah, that, and, that I can, the, and I can say that failure to appear is, is high on a priority list, not just for, as it relates to Senate Bill 3, but just generally at municipal court. I can't speak for what's going on in common police court, uh, but it's something that we're very cognizant of. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I quickly add that the uh, governor appointed about a 20 member warrant task force as a result of a series by dispatch last year that has been meeting, and that's one of the things they have been looking at, and I know uh, a draft uh, report uh, addressing many of those issues is, uh, you know, in the typewriter or in the computer, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, as we speak. <laughs> right. hey, Typewriters, hey, I still have a typewriter, I might add. Most of you, most of you don't. <laughs> Hated to cut you off there. Thank you all for your questions. I hope you all found today's forums in interesting. I certainly learned a lot. Let's thank our speakers, Zach Klein, Ron O'Brien, Cecil Thomas, Larry Abhoff, and Karen Kassler. And thanks to all of you for being here.